I'm Nima Rajan. Canada is providing another $49.5 million in humanitarian aid for millions of Syrians. The money is to help deliver nutritional assistance and health services for communities affected by the decade-long war. International Development Minister Karina Gold says Syrian people deserve the continued support of the international community, and Canada will assist Syrian refugees and those who have been internally displaced. Some residents of long-term care homes in Ontario are urging the province to act on what they say is a gross violation of their basic human rights during the pandemic. They are calling for changes to the COVID-19 restrictions that have kept them confined to their rooms, even though 90% of the residents have now been vaccinated. Many of an estimated 150,000 nursing home residents have been cut off from most relatives as well as the outdoors for as long as 15 months. Lawyer Jane Medu says seniors continue to suffer while anti-pandemic measures loosen in the rest of society. A report from the C.D. Howe Institute says moving child care responsibly from the provinces to Ottawa would be a challenge. The think tank says recent federal efforts on child care show the provinces are unlikely to agree to national standards. The report recommends the federal government bundle child care funding into an annual transfer payment similar to one provides or to the one it provides to help provinces cover the cost of health care. It says the priority should be on expanding the supply of licensed child care spaces. A law allowing people to apply for access to an intimate partner's criminal record came into effect in Alberta on Thursday. Alberta is joining Saskatchewan in imposing legislation informally known as Claire's Law after a British woman was killed by a partner who she didn't know had a history of violence. It allows people who feel they may be at risk to apply for information related to a current or former partner's potential for domestic violence. It also allows police to warn potential victims who they feel might be in danger. A new poll finds two-thirds of Canadians are in favour of stricter gun control laws, with respondents in Quebec showing the most support. The survey, conducted by Liget and the Association for Canadian Studies, also found more than 50% of those polled think a federal buyback program for prohibited firearms should be mandatory, with the threat of fines for gun owners who don't participate. The PEI government is expanding a program to get people back into restaurants during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Dine-In and Save program covers half the tab of restaurant bills, up to $15 per person. At first, the province spent $500,000 on the program, but it has proven so popular that it is spending another $375,000. Andrew Weeks, the manager of Piatto Pizzeria in Charlottetown, says the increase in business has meant he has been able to use extra staff. British Columbia's Auditor General says he has postponed 10 performance audits, largely because of the pandemic's effect on government operations. Michael Pickup says that includes an audit of government substance use services because it could have diverted critical resources away from clinical care and the COVID-19 response. Mr. Pickup says delays to future reviews are also possible, while the government has its hands full responding to the health crisis. The head of municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, is apologizing for sharing a post on social media saying immigration will mean the end to the province's culture. Sheila Fitzgerald says in a tweet that she mindlessly shared the post on her personal Facebook account. In its own series of tweets, Municipalities NL describes the comments shared by Ms. Fitzgerald as racist and says they do not reflect the organization's views. It also notes that she is still on leave after running for the progressive conservatives in the provincial election and losing to the liberal candidate in the Northern Peninsula. The Nova Scotia College of Social Workers is calling for a paradigm shift in how the province views mental health, following what it says was inadequate funding in last week's budget. The 2021-22 budget included a $20 million increase in spending over last year to expand and sustain existing mental health services. But the college says that only represents about 6.3% of the overall health budget, down from 6.7% in the previous year. The recently appointed head of the Canada Infrastructure Bank says the federal agency has a limited runway to prove its worth for the long term. 
Erin Corey says the financing agency created by the Liberals in 2017 can do that by taking out sized risks to attract private backers for large-scale projects. It can also help the bank compete to keep investor dollars in Canada amid low interest rates and higher yields overseas. Mr. Corey says Canadians will likely hear about 10 investments by the summer that would have about $2.5 billion in backing from his agency and $6 billion from the private sector. All right, don't go away. After the break, we talk with the designer of a new podcast and app designed to help preserve memories. We'll be, we'll be right back with more on this story and other national and international news on the Forum Daily, everyone. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after the break. A new and unique podcasting app is looking to give back through oral histories. The app, called Remember This, allows people of all ages to record and share their memories on their phone or computer, which is especially important for those who have been quarantined or are physically distancing themselves from their loved ones. This free-to-use app automatically edits recordings into audio stories, complete with narration and music. Authors can then decide whether to download the file for themselves, share it with friends, or submit it to the Remember This podcast. Well, to share more on this app and to give us a little bit of her oral history, we are joined by Miss Amanda Capito, creator of Remember This, the founder of Lead Podcasting, and the author of Let's Talk Podcasting. Welcome to Forum Daily, Miss Capito. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's start by talking about how to use this app, Remember This, uh, and what exactly can it be used for? Yeah, so Remember This is meant to be capturing oral histories. And so these are intimate stories of our lives that we want to be able to cherish forever. And we know how intimate audio can be as a whole. And especially when remembering stories or loved ones, um, this is meant for that. And so you asked how it works. Basically, people go to rememberthispodcast.com and it's really easy to use, nothing to download. People just click record your story and they get prompted with questions that they can answer. And then once they're done, they click mix and it automatically serves them up a slickly produced story. Well, it seems pretty easy to use, Ms. Capito. Uh, where did the idea of creating this uh, unique podcasting app come from? It seems to have come uh, just in time. <laughs> yeah, so I've actually been thinking about this since before the pandemic. Um, but of course, the pandemic does put an extra, um, you know, little layer of importance in capturing stories, especially those of vulnerable upper, uh, vulnerable communities like the elderly. Um, but really, I was doing a lot of podcasting workshops. I've been in the podcasting industry for many years. And I always had people coming up to me asking me, how can they capture the story of a loved one? They might have someone who was sick or someone who was quite elderly and that they wanted to just capture their story before it was too late. Um, and they'd come to me either with lots of audio themselves or asking me how to do it. And in these moments, it's tough to be able to sit someone down and teach them something like this. This is an entire industry um, when all they want to do is record this one story. And so I was offering to personally help them out. And then I just thought there's got to be a better way beyond just me um, in helping people do this. And so that's what sparked the idea. So I've been working with a team of developers and a lawyer um, to come up with this. We've been working on it for more than a year now before the pandemic, um, but the pandemic definitely lit a fire under us to really get this out there because it is such an important time to be cherishing those around us. Now, uh, considering that it is a relatively new app, how many users do you have so far? Yes, yeah, so we launched about a week and a half ago. And so we've already seen several hundred users across Canada, which is really exciting. We're continuing to try to get the word out there. It definitely is a community give back project for us. So there's no uh, tricks here. We're not trying to make money. We're just trying to provide a service for people that we saw was really needed and empower people to tell their stories and share them. And uh, what are uh, the demographics of these users so far? Yeah, so we're seeing that people of all ages, like you mentioned in the introduction, can use this app. It's very user friendly. So if you do have someone who's tech savvy in your family, whether it's a child or an elderly person, um, we're really seeing all ages come to use the app. But we do see that the stories that are being submitted are mostly of older generations. Um, and that's exactly what it was made for, really trying to capture those oral histories. So uh, what kind of stories can you find already uploaded to the uh, Remember This podcast? 
Right. So if people like th their story and they want to submit it, it has a chance of making it up onto the podcast feed, which is a special thing that we're not seeing with podcasting right now. A lot of it is very one way direction. This is kind of a two way direction with listeners, which is special. Um, so right now we just have the trailer up, but we are going to be having stories from users. So people who have submitted and original interviews that I've conducted. So before the pandemic, I toured some long term care facilities and captured the stories of people that were there wanting to learn more about podcasting. We did this all pro bono as again, a give back to the community. And so one of the voices you'll hear in the trailer right now is of Peggy. She was pushing a hundred years old and I got to talk to her about her life, you know, and she was just telling me about, um, her and her husband and how they were part of a chess club and touring across Canada, competing in chess competitions, such a sweet and endearing story. Um, and I actually just found out, found out a couple of weeks ago that uh, Peggy unfortunately passed away, not from COVID, but just old age. And um, I think it just goes to show that how important this is. And, and I'm really lucky to be able to have captured her story before it was too late. All right, Ms. Capito. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Forum Daily and uh, talking about this really interesting app, ma'am. Uh, and we hope to have you back on the show. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Don't go away. More news from across Canada coming up after the break, along with international headlines after that. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. The chief medical advisor at Health Canada says Canadians can be confident that no quarters were cut as five COVID-19 vaccines were swiftly approved. Dr. Supriya Sharma says it took an average of 82 days for Health Canada to review and approve the five vaccines authorized for COVID-19, a process that might usually take more than a year. Dr. Sharma says experts have been poring over thousands of pages of data to make sure any vaccine used in Canada meets extremely high standards for safety and effectiveness. Flight safety investigators say the pilot of a Snowbirds jet that crashed in Kamloops, B.C. last May did not know the recommendations of past reports. Those reports instructed pilots to climb straight ahead following a bird strike on takeoff to give themselves time, time to regain control or allow for a safe ejection. Instead, Captain Richard McDougall tried to turn his Tudor jet and return to the airport because he was worried about crashing into a residential area. Mr. McDougall was seriously injured in the crash and his passenger, Captain Jennifer Casey, was killed. Manitoba is setting up a rent bank to help low- to moderate-income families who need help paying their rent. Families Minister Rochelle Squires says the $5.6 million program will hand out interest-free loans to people who are behind on their rent or need to move to more appropriate housing. Minister Squires says the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the need to support renters who may have lost income and can't make monthly payments. The money is to be administered through the Manitoba Nonprofit Housing Association. Through or though a historic number of women ran in Newfoundland and Labrador's provincial election, the number of women in the legislature will remain unchanged. Last week's preliminary results from Elections NL show nine women were elected across the province's 40 districts. That's the same number of women who sat in the legislature before it was dissolved on January 15th to make for an election call. Jillian Peterson of Equal Voice NL says allowances for child care and elder care as campaign expenses could help get more women involved in politics. Wearing masks could be a staple of post-COVID Canada. A poll by researchers at the University of Saskatchewan suggests 61% of respondents believe the virus will have a long positive impact on mask use. Overall, their survey indicates people feel differently about how the pandemic will impact their lives and that there's a lot of uncertainty about what communities will look like once they are no longer threatened by the virus. Canada's defense minister has paid tribute to Canada's only all-black unit to serve during the First World War. Harjit Sajjan told a virtual event that the 600 members of the No. 2 Construction Battalion and their descendants are owed an apology for the racism they faced despite their willingness to serve. Minister Sajjan says plans are in the works for a formal apology from the federal government. 
As many companies pledge to attract and retain or more diverse talent, experts say they need to call people by their names. Sonia Kang is the Canada Research Chair in Identity, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Toronto. She says workers from diverse backgrounds have long been pressured to adopt nicknames or accept mispronunciations in the workplace. Ms. Kang says one way companies can support workers' choices for names is through online tools that record clips of staff pronouncing their own names. Canadian Blood Services is reassuring the public that blood donated by those who have had COVID-19 or who have received a vaccine is safe. More than 955,000 people have been infected in Canada in the past year, and the long-term effects are still mostly unknown. A spokeswoman for the blood agency, Chantelle Pamburn, says since COVID-19 is a respiratory virus, there is no danger of it being transmitted through blood. Ms. Pamburn says that blood supply has remained constant since the pandemic began. She says there even appears to be an increase in new donors. Imagine someone electronically watching you as you sleep. It's one of the features of Google's next internet-connected home device. The new version of the Google Nest Hub will have sleep-sensing technology. Like its forerunner, the Hub can display pictures and videos in addition to other data. It will also monitor your sleeping patterns from your bedside. It uses radar to detect motion, including how deeply a sleeper is breathing. It will generate weekly reports about how long and how well you slumber. The world's largest social networking platform says it is working on a version of its Instagram app for kids under 13. Facebook announced that it is developing a version of its photo-based app for preteens who technically aren't allowed to use the app in its current form due to federal privacy rules. Critics have been cool to the idea of a kid version of Instagram. They say it's just a way for Facebook to grow its user base and condition kids to use their products so it can make money off of them later. All right, stay with us. More news coming up next in our international segment. In the U.S., New York State has legalized recreational marijuana. European Union officials plan to travel to Turkey next week, and Nike is launching a lawsuit over pairs of controversial shoes. These stories and more when we return on the Forum Daily, so don't go away, anyone. We'll be right back after the break. Lawmakers in New York State have reached an agreement to legalize recreational marijuana sales. New York's past efforts to pass marijuana have failed in recent years. Democrats, who now have a veto-proof majority in the state legislature, have made passing it a priority. The legislation would take effect immediately if passed, though sales wouldn't start immediately as New York sets up rules and a proposed cannabis board. The European Union's top officials will travel to Turkey next week for talks with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. EU leaders agreed to improve cooperation on migration and trade with Ankara last week. They offered new incentives to Turkey, despite de democratic backsliding in the country and lingering concerns about its energy ambitions in the Mediterranean Sea. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and EU Council President Charles Michel will make the trip to Turkey on April 6th. The UN's premier global body fighting for gender equality is calling for a sharp increase of women in global decision making. The Commission on the Status of Women reaffirmed the blueprint to achieve gender equality adopted 25 years ago at the Beijing Women's Conference. It is shining a spotlight on the imbalance of power between men and women in public life and the growing impact of violence against women and girls in the digital world. International Monetary Fund Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva says prospects for global growth have brightened since January. She says when the IMF released its updated economic forecast next week, it will show the global economy growing at a faster pace than the 5.5% gain that the fund projected at the start of the year. But she warns that uneven progress in fighting the pandemic could jeopardize the economic gains. Critically endangered North Atlantic right whales reached the waters of Cape Cod Bay off Massachusetts this week as they migrated toward the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration spotted 89 of the whales in the bay on March 21st, including three pairs of mothers and calves. The whales are vulnerable to ship strikes and entanglement in fishing gear, and the agency is reminding vessel operators to slow down to 10 knots or less. Virgin Galactic rolled out its newest spaceship as it looks to resume test flights at its spacecraft America headquarters in the New Mexico desert. 
Company officials said it will likely be summer before the ship starts glide flight testing. That will coincide with the final round of testing for the current generation of spacecraft. A new study by Harvard University researchers contradicts the long-held opinion that patients shouldn't be Googling their symptoms. It concludes that Internet searches can help to reach a correct diagnosis without increasing a patient's anxiety. Researchers found that adults 40 years or older, women, and those with poor health status were superior at reaching a diagnosis. That appears to be because they got information from reputable websites and not social media. Nike has filed a lawsuit over a limited edition line of so shoes developed in partnership with Lil Nas X. Dubbed the Satan Shoe, each pair reportedly contains a single drop of human blood. Nike is suing in part because it says it doesn't want people to think it is associated with Satanism. The shoes sell for more than $1,000 and the 666 pairs sold out in about a minute. The head of the U.S. Retail, Wholesale and Department Store Union says what happens with a push to certify a union at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama could spark an explosion of organizing across America. Organizers are pushing about 6,000 Amazon workers to join on the promise that it will lead to better working conditions, better pay and more respect. Amazon argues that it already offers more than twice the minimum wage in Alabama and workers get benefits without paying union dues. Volkswagen of America says a release issued this week saying that it was changing its name to Volkswagen to show its commitment to electric vehicles was a pre-April Fool's Day prank. The company's spokesperson, who insisted the release was legitimate and the name change accurate, admitted that the statement was a joke. The company's fake news release, which leaked on Monday, resulted in multiple media outlets reporting on the name change. Hockey legend Mark Messier says he hopes his upcoming book inspires people to do their best. His memoir, No One Wins Alone, comes out in October. The six-time Stanley Cup winner writes about being the son of a hockey player and coach, a teammate of Wayne Gretzky on the Edmonton Oilers, and the captain of the New York Rangers. Mr. Messier says he thought he was in the hockey business for 25 years, but eventually realized that he was in the people business. During his 25 years in the NHL, Mr. Messier played on six Stanley Cup championships championship teams. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and be sure to follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You could also watch all of our news and commentary programming on the News Forum YouTube channel. All right, thanks for joining us on Forum Daily, and we'll see you next time, everyone. Have a great weekend.